Crystal Bear. This fall, the PBS series on the Civil War got the largest audience that uh, has ever tuned in public television, I believe. A series that was beautifully, beautifully made, I thought, from old photographs and old tunes and passages from old letters. And the intense interest in it surely showed that the Civil War is our great saga, is the story that we all know and the story that we all love to hear again. In tribute to this series, we've invited Jay Unger and Molly Mason, who played some of the tunes on the beautiful soundtrack, to join me here as we do a few excerpts from a book entitled Company H, First Tennessee Regiment, a book by Sam R. Watkins, published in 1882. Do you remember those times? Fort Sumter was fired upon from Charleston by troops under General Beauregard. The die was cast. War was declared. From that day on, every person almost was eager for the war. And we were all afraid it would be over and we not in the fight. Companies were made up, regiments organized, left, left, left was heard from morning till night by the right flank file left march were familiar sounds and a long line of box cars was drawn up at camp cheatham one morning in july the bugle sounded to strike tents and to place everything on board the cars every soldier had enough blankets shirts pants and old boots to last a year and the empty bottles and jugs would have set up a first-class drugstore in addition, every one of us had his gun, cartridge box, knapsack, and three days rations, a pistol on each side, and a long bowie knife. We got in, and on top of the box cars, the whistle sounded, and amid the waving of hats, handkerchiefs, and flags, we bid a long farewell. We went bowling along 20 or 30 miles an hour, as fast as steam could carry us. At Chattanooga, Knoxville, Bristol, Farmville, Lynchburg, everywhere, demonstrations of joy and welcome greeted us. But the Yankees are advancing on the Manassas. July 21st finds us 100 miles from that fierce day's battle. That night, after the battle is fought and won, our train finally draws up at Manassas Junction. We felt the war was over, and we would have to return home without even seeing a Yankee soldier. How we envied those that were wounded. We would have given a thousand dollars to have been in the battle and to have had our arm shot off so we could have returned home with an empty sleeve. But the battle was over, and we felt left out. Three years later, war had become a reality. We were tired of it. We cursed the war. We cursed General Bragg. We cursed the Southern Confederacy. A law was made by the Confederate States Congress about this time allowing every person who owned 20 Negroes to go home. Gave us the blues. We wanted 20 Negroes. There was raised the cry of rich man's war, poor man's fight. The glory of the war, the glory of the South, the glory and the pride of our volunteers had no charms for us. The poor privates had but one ambition now, and that was to get out of the army in some way or another. They hated war. 
They were deserting by thousands. They had no love or respect for General Bragg. They had no faith in his abilities as a general. He was looked upon as a merciless tyrant. He loved to crush the spirit of his men. Not a single soldier in the whole army ever loved or respected him. But he's dead now. Peace to his ashes. We're marching for Cumberland Gap. There are no provisions in the country. It has long since been laid waste. Fourth day out. The scene was grand, but grand scenery had but little attraction for a hungry soldier. Along the route, it was nothing but tramp, 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 uphill and downhill, through long and dusty lanes, weary, worn out, and hungry. It was tramp, tramp, tramp. You might hear the occasional words, close up, but outside of that, it was tramp, tramp, tramp. I've seen soldiers fast asleep as they staggered along in their places in the ranks. I know that on many a weary's night march I have slept and slept soundly while marching along. After a while we would see the morning star rise in the east and then after a while the dim gray twilight and finally we could discover the outlines of our file leader and after a while we could make out the outlines of trees and other objects. Lafayette Rosencrantz's army was very near us, and we expected before three days elapsed to be engaged in battle. In fact, we knew there must be a fight or a foot race, one or the other. We could smell the battle far off. The next morning, the assembly sounded about two o'clock. We marched 25 miles to Lafayette, marched back to Chickamauga. Saturday morning we commenced to cross over when an order came double quick General Forrest's cavalry had opened the battle even then the spent balls were falling amongst us with that peculiar thud so familiar to your old soldier double quick there seemed to be no rest for us Forrest was needing reinforcements double quick close up in the rear sizz sizz double quick boom hurry up bang bang a rattle de bang bang sizz boom Hurry up, double quick, boom, bang. Halt, front, right dress, boom, boom. And three soldiers are killed and 20 wounded. Billy Webster's arm was torn out by the roots and he killed and a fragment of shell buried itself in Jim McEwen's side, also killing Mr. Fane King, a conscript from Mount Pleasant. Forward, guide, center, march, charge, bayonets, fire at will, commence firing. We debouched through the woods, firing as we marched, the Yankee line about 200 yards off. We advanced in 10 minutes, we were face to face with the foe. It was but a question as to who could load and shoot the fastest. We held our position for two hours and 10 minutes in the midst of a deadly fire, being enfiladed, almost surrounded, when General Forrest galloped up and said, Colonel Field, look out, you're almost surrounded, you better fall back and the order was given to retreat. I ran through a solid line of blue coats. As I fell back, they were on the right of us, they were on the left of us, and in the rear of us. It was a hornet's nest. The balls whistled around our ears like the escape valves of 10,000 engines. The woods seemed to be blazing. Everywhere, at every jump, would rise a lurking foe, but to get up and dust was all we could do. I was running along by the side of Bob Stout. General Smith stopped me and asked if our brigade was falling back. I told him it was. I heard him call out, attention, forward. One solid sheet of leaden hail was falling around me. I heard General Smith's brigade open. It seemed to be platoons of artillery. The earth trembled like an earthquake deadly missiles in every direction. I could almost hear the shriek of the death angel passing 
over the scene. General Smith was killed in 10 minutes after I saw him. Bob Stout and myself stopped. I said, Bob, you weren't killed as you expected to be. And at that very moment, a solid shot struck him between the waist and the hip, tearing off one leg and scattering his bowels all over the ground. The firing seemed to be from all sides and was rattling among the leaves and bushes. The air was full of smoke. I'd been looking a hundred yards ahead when happening to look not more than 10 paces from me, I saw a young Yankee lieutenant peering through the bushes. I would rather not have killed him. I was afraid to fire and afraid to run, and yet I did not wish to kill him. He was as pretty as a woman, and somehow I thought I had met him before. Our eyes met. He stood like a statue. He gazed at me with a kind of scared expression. I still did not want to kill him, and am sorry today that I did, for I believe I could have captured him. But I fired and saw the blood spurt all over his face. He was the prettiest youth I ever saw. When I fired, the Yankees broke and ran. I went up to the boy I had killed, and the blood was gushing out of his mouth. I was sorry. While stationed at Chattanooga, rations were very scarce and hard to get. And it was about this time we learned that Pemberton's army at Vicksburg were subsisting entirely on rats. We had once started out rat hunting, but we couldn't find any. Presently, we came to an old outhouse, and out jumped a big gray rat. After hard work, we caught him. We skinned him, washed and salted him, buttered and peppered him and fried him. He actually looked nice. The delicate aroma of the frying rat put our teeth on edge. After a while, he was said to be done. I got a piece of cold corn dodger, laid my piece of the rat on it, ate a little piece of bread and raised the piece of rat to my mouth when I lost my appetite for dead rat. I did not eat any rat. It was my first and last effort to eat dead rats. God alone fits and prepares us for the things that are in store for us. There is none so wise as to foresee the future or foretell the end. God sometimes seems afar off, but he will never leave or forsake anyone who puts his trust in him. But on this day, of which I now write, we could see in plain view more than a thousand Yankee battle flags waving on top of the red earthworks, not more than 400 yards off. And here was but a demoralized remnant facing the whole Yankee army. We had everything against us. The soldiers distrusted everything. They were broken down with their long days hard marching, were almost dead with hunger and fatigue. Everyone was taking his own course and wishing and praying to be captured. Each one prayed that all this foolishness might end one way or the other. It was too much for human endurance. Every private soldier knew that such things as this could not last. The mantle of charity had long ago fallen upon those who think differently from us. We remember no longer wrongs and injustice done us by anyone on earth. We look up above and beyond all these petty groveling things and shake hands and forget the past. The tale is told, the world moves on, the sun shines as brightly as before, the flowers bloom as beautifully, the birds sing as sweetly, the trees nod and bow their leafy tops as if slumbering in the breeze. 
The gentle winds fan our brow and kiss our cheek as they pass by. The pale moon sheds her silver sheen. The blue dome of the sky sparkles with the trembling stars that twinkle and shine and make night beautiful. And the scene melts and gradually disappears forever. <laughs> Reading from the memoirs of a soldier in Company 8, the 1st Tennessee Regiment, from the city. That's our show for tonight. We want to thank Paula Poundstone for being here, and thanks to Rob Fisher, our music director in the Coffee Club Orchestra back here. The Broadway Local Theater of Ivy Austin, Adam Bryant, Pamela McLernan, and Richard Mullins. Our sound effects man, Mr. Tom Keith. Tonight's show, written by Emanuel Transmission and Ken Lezebnik, produced by Christine Cheetah, our production manager, Steve Kelm. Technical direction by Scott Rivard with Brian Killian, Eric Von Ransom, and Linda O'Brien. Orchestrations and arrangements by Russell Warner, Gary Fagan, and Andy Stein. Thanks to our crew. Thanks to this great orchestra back here, too. The American Radio Company's principal sponsor is the American Booksellers Association and additional funding provided by this public radio station. Take us out here, won't you, please? This is the American Public Radio Network. Local presentation of the American Radio Company of the Air made possible in part by grants from the Crystal Geyser Company, makers of Crystal Geyser's Juice Squeeze, and by Circuit City, a national retailer of brand name consumer electronics and appliances. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Marty Moss Cohen, and this is Fresh Air. You're listening to Fresh Air here at 88.5 FM, KQED Radio, San Francisco. Jane Goodall may know more about mankind's nearest relatives than anyone else on Earth. For more than 30 years, Goodall's been studying the chimpanzees of East Africa. On this edition of Fresh Air, Jane Goodall tells us what we humans can learn from apes. Also today, we meet actor Paul Winfield. He plays Judge Laren Little in the movie Presumed Innocent. And Maureen Cargan tells us what it's like to live in one of the world's greatest tourist cities when all the tourist attractions close down. That's all coming up on today's Fresh Air. From 99.5
National Public Radio in Washington, I'm Nora Rahm. Germans voted today in their first post-unification election, casting ballots for officials in Bavaria and in five new states of former East Germany. According to exit polls, Chancellor Helmut Kohl's Christian Democratic Union has emerged as the clear winner. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney estimates there are now more than 200,000 American soldiers, sailors and airmen in the Persian Gulf, and the build-up is not yet over. Cheney is in London for a two-day visit with British officials on the Gulf crisis. He said it appears that Iraq now has more than 400,000 troops in Kuwait and southern Iraq. While Cheney is in London, British Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd is in Cairo, also for talks on the Persian Gulf situation. Today, he made some of the harshest statements to date, directing them to Iraq. Jack Thompson of the BBC reports. It's the tone rather than the content of this latest speech by Mr. Hurd which catches the attention. Saddam Hussein said the Foreign Secretary will withdraw from Kuwait. His only choice is whether to leave of his own free will or at the point of a gun. We must give sanctions a chance to work, said Mr. Hurd, but we will not wait forever. And if Saddam Hussein does not leave of his own free will, then we will have to force him out. There's no other possibility. Mr. Hurd has said much of this before, but not in quite such strident terms. And there's no doubt his aim now is to step up the rhetoric against Iraq. But the Foreign Secretary also fixed Israel in his sights again. I repeat our condemnation of the actions of the Israeli police in Jerusalem, he said. Nothing could excuse excessive use of force on this scale, said Mr. Hurd. Jack Thompson of the BBC. Although the latest opinion polls show that President Bush's popularity has dipped, partly in response to the budget stalemate, White House Chief of Staff John Sununu insists the American people blame the Congress, not the President. Sununu said it's clear that it's Congress's fault for failing to resolve the budget issues once and for all. We are six months late in the process. We wouldn't be here if the president hadn't taken the lead, brought the summit together, and if we hadn't worked with the leadership long and hard to bring a package to the point we have it. The problem has always been a problem of Congress being able to muster the political will to vote for a tough package. And Sununu said that if people find they're confused about the key budget issues, that too is the fault of Congress. The president has said he likes the summit package. He wants the solution as close as possible to the summit package. It's Congress drifting back and forth, trying to find variations of the theme that is trying to find some combination to set.